Praise the Lord. Let's remind ourselves what we've been talking about for the last year. As uh, Pastor Dan started, uh, uh, started uh, teaching the book of Luke, and we started last July, and we have gotten to the 22nd chapter of Luke. If you can uh, enlarge. Okay. We're going to read uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 65. Uh, let's feed on it and let's uh, fill up with the word of God. If you're here to taste the word of God, you're in the right place. And if you came with, without appetite, well, we pray that God will give you an appetite. Let's review our story. Um, so we talked about the uh, temple of the Lord, and the people started uh, admiring the uh, temple, and they were um, priding themselves of their own creation. And Jesus actually prophesied and said that this temple that you see will be uh, destroyed one day. And then Jesus speaks about the latter days, the end times, and he gives uh, signs of the latter days, the last days, before his return. And there will be some signs that will uh, come about before Jesus returns. And that is the rapture that's going to happen. Once these signs occur, and then Jesus will return in a rapture, in the rapture, and take um, his people unto himself. And everybody's interested when it's going to happen. The greatest joy is that we all anticipate his return. And Jesus says, This generation shall not pass, and all the signs that you see. The generation shall not pass until those signs have happened before the Lord returns. Is it, uh, it does it pertain to us? Uh, the answer to that is that we do not know the time of the end times. And Jesus said that we do not know, and we should live as though it may happen today. And we want to anticipate his return even today. So let's be ready and be aware and be in prayer because we do not know when the time will happen. And today's topic will also deal with that uh, topic that uh, we have to be ready, awake for his return. And, and we know that Jesus points out the betrayer and what role did Judas play in this and, and Peter's role in that he will not uh, betray him, he will sacrifice his life and then Jesus rebuked him saying that you will deny me three times before the clock closes. That, that is the context that we're in right now. And what happens be after that, and Jesus goes uh, to the Garden of Olivet, and this is where he dedicated himself in prayer, and this is where we pick up the story from 39. Let's pray. Dear Father, please guide me and teach me to speak correctly as I'm weak and I depend upon you. Our strength comes from you and everything is just, you're the source of everything in our lives so that you work in the hearts of the people and soften the hardened heart and place in them a heart of flesh so that the word of God bring fruit in their lives. Let the, the word rebuke the sinful heart and let us be 
close to you and uh, let us enjoy your presence in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Here we learn Jesus, as his habit was, rose up and went into prayer. If the Lord, being the Son of God, the Father, and being in the flesh as man, needed to pray, how much do we need to learn from Him that we need to be in prayer and in relationship with the Lord? Last week, Brother Eddie, we see Jesus as our teacher, as our leader, and our our life should depend upon his life example, and we should follow him. And if Jesus has that habit to pray, he is our example that we should be praying as well. You know, a prayer has many purposes. Let me share with you a few things while we pray. Let me give you an example as the example is there, but let's find out the purpose and the meaning of prayer. Why are we praying? First of all, when we are praying our will, we bring our will to the will of the Father. We want His will to be done. We definitely share our will, our desire to the Lord, but it is His will that overrules our will. 1 John 5 says, this is our confidence that whatever we ask in his name, he will hear us. This is where our agreement, consent happens with him. We are human beings and we don't see everything. We see limited perspective of what it is. We don't know the past, the present, or the future. We ha we know that he is the one that holds us together. He's the one that uh, exercises his will, and we bring our will to his will. We also bring ourselves closer to him. In Hebrews chapter 4, let's approach him with confidence through the seat of our Lord so that we can find mercy from Him. Sometimes we have uh, we have confidence, we have this notion that we should be approaching, but we do not. We have access to the Lord. We have uh, completely, the veil is torn and we have clear access to him through his word and we can approach him through our prayer and last thing is we have to bring our needs to the lord so that we can ask for his help uh, philippians 4 6 and 7 be anxious for nothing but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to god this is our responsibility to bring our needs to the lord these are the three aspects of prayer. The last thing we hear, we hear from verses 39 to 46, Jesus says, why are you sleeping? Be in prayer so that you will not fall into temptation. The purpose of the prayer is to help us not to fall into temptation. And this is how our Lord, he is coming to God, his Father, and saying, please, Take this cup away from me, yet not my will, by yours be done. Which which cup is he talking about? 
that was the bitter cup uh, that was designed for us. That was the bitter cup that was the uh, anger of the Lord because of our sin. So that cup that he drank, it was for us because he didn't want that cup because it's the unity between Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is the historic moment where the Son will be um, forsaken because of the sin on our behalf. And that is what was struggle, the struggling uh, Jesus, because he didn't want to take the sin because that was a hard thing, but he wanted to drink that for our sake so that we can have the cup of blessing that comes to us because of his sacrifice on our behalf. Here's something else is written here. And an angel came about and encouraged him, comforted him, strengthened him. That is an amazing reality that when we come broken in prayer and supplicate and bring our request to the Lord, and it's amazing how the Lord comes through his angel and lifts us and comforts us and, uh, and builds us up as we approach the Lord, the Lord approaches us and strengthens us. We don't pray to the angels, but the angels become his servants. And through them, we are strengthened and um, empowered and enabled to be able to walk through the trials and the challenges of this life, which are many. And he says, be awake uh, so that you will not fall into temptation. This is not physical uh, awakening, but it's spiritual awakening that we would need to be awake uh, spiritually. And we need the prayer to keep us awake. And alert. Let's try to understand what does it mean to be tempted. In James, there's a clear explanation there. There's two temptations that happen. Pray that you will not fall into temptation is the text here. In the Lord's Prayer, there's a passage where it says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But then we see, when Jesus was being baptized at the beginning of his service, and after his baptism, he was led by the Spirit to be tempted in the wilderness. And on the one hand, we are praying that God will not lead us into temptation, but then we see that how the Spirit took Jesus into temptation. But then we also read in James that he allows certain temptations to come our way. And the reason beyond it is to test, it, to test our faith, to see how strong is our faith how reliable is our faith. But we have to look at the scripture as a whole and realize that in one place it says, do not lead us into temptation. In another place we see that he does lead us. And so the scripture gives a full explanation of why sometimes we do, into, we do go into temptation where God is testing our faith. In James chapter 1, 2, consider all a joy to go into various kinds of temptations and trials because through these God is building our uh, confidence in him. Be happy is when you go through trials and difficulties. Every time you go into hardships, sufferings, per persecution because of our faith, but then there are internal temptations. When tempted, so no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. When when there's a desire within us, even though it's not sin, but it, the desire comes, and if I don't fight against that, it will turn into sin. This is what the passage talks about. Pray that you will not 
fall into temptation, that that desire becomes temptation and you give into temptation and you delve into sin. So stay awake and fight against the desire of going into sin. If prayer is so good and so helpful, why are we not praying more? And the truth is that the more we pray, the more we need. There are some people who do not understand um, that clearly what it means to be in prayer. It's not just you call the Lord. It is something that we uh, need to be prayer but we are too busy and as a result of it our prayer life is reduced but when you're looking in china where christians are being persecuted because of the uh, regime soviet regime over there they are constantly in prayer because they realize that they are, through their prayer they are gaining faith and trust because they want the lord to come into their lives we do have a comfortable life here and uh, nobody is persecuting us so we um, basically take everything for granted and everything is safe and secure so for us uh, there is no such need as much as there is for people who live in those areas where they are persecuted or are in uncertain times and we do the same thing when we live in uncertain times we run for safety and through prayer we find that safety and we are very busy here in this world. Uh, there's so much information, even in our uh, phones. There's no room left for God to uh, intervene and give us his word. We don't have the resource to be given to us because we're too busy with our own world, with the devices that we have in our hands. So if, if you think that, uh, oh, I'll find time and I'll get time and I'll do it, uh, I'll find time and whenever I want, I'll pray. And we take it uh, leisurely and we are so busy with so many other things that we uh, do not desire anymore because we're so busy and your days are going by, your hours are going by and it's not happening in your life. So my thought for you is you are the responsible person for your time and you need to designate the time and spend time for prayer now in the past i used to pray in the mornings and um, in the mornings i'm very busy i'm running from one thing to another i'm busy with my kids waking them up taking them to school but at night when everybody's asleep i enter into my uh, time alone and i spend the night spending time prayer and i will decide to stay up and, and stay in prayer we sometimes go into our room and we just give our list of uh, requests from the lord and then we just uh, move on and that is not right either imagine you go on a date and and while you're on date and you decide we're going to talk about this we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about this instead of enjoying the presence of the lord and humbling ourselves and apologize for not spending enough time with him and give our focus to him our attention to him we really need his, his mercy when i'm entering in with uh, the need of mercy and the need for him then you are forgetting your busy life you leave those behind those things but we need to remember that every minute that we have is given to us by god and he is allowing us to live another day uh, and we understand that everything that we do everything that we have salvation everything that we have and we are rejoicing in that those are all his mercies given to us and you come to the fact that who am i that i should have actually the right to give you my request but i'm actually in awe of all that i have received from him 
and we are in awe of what he has done for us and we come to him with deep understanding that I don't deserve to be in your presence and yet you allow me to be in your presence and that's when the prayer comes in in my moment of prayer where I understand what God is looking in us and wanting from us that we come with humble hearts and recognize his goodness to us and so we continue to verse 47 Luke chapter 22 47 talks about Judas. And there are many questions. What happened to this man? What was, he was one of the active uh, disciples, and yet something happened in his life. And something, his life changed, his movements changed. Verse 47, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our hand swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man here and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Let's look at uh, the story of Judas. The topic for the sermon today, this is uh, co quotation, under quotation, the gospel of Judas. What happened to Judas that we can learn from his example? What was going on in his life? Let's understand. Let's understand what's going on. John 17, 17. When I was with them uh, on earth, Jesus is praying. I was keeping them in your name, and nobody was lost except the one this, uh, that you had decided. And in John 13, uh, when he was washing the disciples' feet, whoever is washed is completely washed, except for the feet. You are clean, not all of you, because he knew who was going to betray him. That's why he was saying one of them was not clean. There was a difference between the, the main disciples and Judas, and Jesus distinguished them, separated them. When you're reading the scripture, the Gospels, there's nowhere that um, you read where none of the none of the miracles that were happening were happening. Um, Everybody was seeing, except Judas. He was doing the uh, miracles through all of them. Matthew 7 says, those who say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied, we, we took, uh, we took out demons and, and, Jesus, in that example, said, I don't know you because you were not one of mine. I don't know you. And Judas is one of that uh, person that he was not acknowledged. Uh, he was one of the ones, the ones, he was one of the ones that God used uh, to perform miracles, but that doesn't verify or clarify that he was uh, one of the right disciples. Judas uh, believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew that uh, he was God's son. He was uh, here to save the Israelites. Judas believed that he was to come and to sit on uh, his throne and he would be ruling the 
uh, Israelites in the world. He knew all of those, and he believed that. Why, after knowing all of those things, did he betray Jesus? The problem with Judas was confined his faith on the earthly uh, kingdom of the Lord. He was all interested to get the position on this earth, and he was looking at his own prophet. And this is um, historically, some historians say that he betrayed him so that he would uh, move his hand so that he can take over the kingdom. And when Jesus did not rebel, did not do what Judas was expecting, Judas was disappointed, was upset because he was hoping that Jesus would uh, take position of what he had come for. So that was his point. That was what he wanted to do. He, he wanted Jesus to act and take up the position. So we know that afterwards he went and bought a land and then he hung himself with that farm that that's where he hung himself and he died. So why did he go and buy that? At that time, uh, um, those uh, land were designated as a uh, grave. So those land, the land that it was designated for burial because uh, those the land was not fruitful, was not productive. So basically that was designated for, uh, for burial sites. And so basically, so basically, that was a business that the uh, field was being used. Yeah. Matthew 27 says that he repented of what he did, or he, um, he, he wanted what he intended for Jesus to claim, but it didn't happen. So he was upset and he was disappointed and he regretted, not repented, he regretted. So you have to compare this. Regret is where Judas regretted for what he did because it didn't produce the result that he expected to happen. Uh, my suggestion is that Judas never really knew Jesus. He, his expectation was that he would sit on the royal throne and he would do the things on this world and whatever this world would demand of a king. That's what he wanted Jesus to be. So he looked at that as a business opportunity for him. So Jesus would take care of the um, with the problems of the Israel. But he did not recognize what Jesus had intended. Can he, could he see that Jesus' purpose was uh, universal to save the lost? He could not understand that. He would not understand that. And because if he understood that after he regretted, if he had repented, who knows? Um, it was a major sin that he uh, did, but there may have been uh, hope for him to be saved. We always think of Judas as a bad person that would not be worthy of forgiveness or deserve forgiveness. But if Judas really repented, there would be salvation for him. But as a man, even though God had um, God had predestined that to happen, but God would have also not betrayed His own principle. And so today we ask the same question: If Hitler or Stalin or uh, the people who killed so many people, if they really re repented, would God forgive? Would have forgiven them? The answer is yes. There is no sin that is so great that God cannot forgive. If you uh, are regretting and you understand that uh, your sin is so big, God will never forgive. There is no such sin 
God will not forgive. If you repent, he will definitely forgive. And if we don't repent, if we don't go to him again, it comes from our pride that we do not submit ourselves, surrender ourselves to cleanse ourselves, that God can cleanse. It's the pride that does not allow us to go um, and ask the Lord to forgive. If God, some people say, well, if that's the case, everybody is going to say that we can live as whatever, however way we want to live our lives and eventually we come to God and he will forgive us if that's the case. But the problem with that is you don't know when you're going to die and whether you will have that opportunity to repent. And the third important thing is that today is the day of salvation, today is the day of repentance. Let's go to verse 54, chapter 22 of Luke. This is, uh, then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance, but when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he did not. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, he replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly, this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. This is uh, the word for about Peter, but all of the other disciples left Jesus. Judas betrayed him. Uh, the disciples left him. Peter was following him. The truth is that all of them left Jesus. Nobody stood by Jesus. There is no sin that is big or small. All of them were sinners. All of them made, committed that sin. And now understand Peter's position. Three times he denies. The cock crows. Jesus looks at him. While Jesus is being beaten up. And in all of that, he stops and looks at Peter. Can you imagine that? Matthew 10, 10, 32. There's a word there. Those who confess me with in front of people, then I will confess them in front of the Father. And he who denies me in front of people, I will deny in front of my Father. Can you imagine Peter's memory where he remembers what Jesus had said? That if you confess me in front of men, I will confess you in front of my father. Judas did not know Jesus. Peter knew Jesus. Peter followed him. Peter wanted to be next to Jesus because he knew how merciful Jesus was and how he had shown mercy to him. Sin has to be rebuked through the Holy Spirit. When we read the word, we are rebuked by the Holy Spirit through his word. But always, Jesus offers his salvation, offers his forgiveness to us. Look at Peter here. Just imagine for a moment what Peter is seeing. Do you remember what Peter said? I'm uh, willing to sacrifice myself. I'm willing to give up my own rights. I will do everything, just like the, us Armenians do. We are so committed. We gung-ho, we're going to do everything for you. 
But Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. God's word says, whoever thinks he stands, be careful lest he fall. There is a self-confidence putting our trust in ourselves. In other words, I can do whatever I want to do. And even in serving the church, we think we are the ones that are doing it. We are, we are the ones that are accomplishing it. We feel that everything is happening to us. And the truth is that everything that comes, the ability that comes, comes from the Lord. We can trust in ourselves. We can build our confidence in ourselves, but we have to understand that it's the Lord that enables us. He's the one that empowers us. He's the one that, especially when we're serving Him and doing things for His glory. And Jesus told Peter to pray before getting there so that they will not fall into temptation. So he's thinking, maybe I fell asleep. Maybe if Peter had prayed and the disciples had actually prayed, I wonder what would have happened if they really took serious, uh, that call seriously. We don't know. Maybe Maybe it, they would not have fallen into the same temptation. Maybe they would have come here or something would have happened. And maybe for Peter, he may not have denied Jesus if he had prayed. And there's something significant in the look of Jesus, where he looked with a compassionate eye, with a rebuke eye. And I uh, forewarned you that this might happen. But understand, and Jesus looked at him, and Peter saw his eye, and he saw that uh, look, which was forgiving, compassionate. Well, Jesus gave the same look to Judas. Judas ran away and fell down and killed himself. What a sad thing. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that your word teaches us to be in prayer and be aware of temptations that may come so that you may empower us, enable us. We pray that you help us, teach us that our hope would be in you and not in our own strength, but in you only. You're the one that strengthens us. You're the one that enables us. You're the one that helps us to overcome temptations. It's through you, and we thank you that you forgive us, that you restore us, that you take care of us. And when we come with repentance, you come as a father, as a compassionate father, that we have salvation through you. And the cup that you drank for us, and that's through that cup that we have the hope of salvation and our relationship with our Father who is in heaven, who empowers us and enables us. In Jesus' name, amen.